and she'll give you a couple updates. And then Candace, are you gonna start the video then right away? After you speak? Uh, yes, you okay. mean the recording or the video that Chris sent the link for? Both. <laughs> okay, okay. So, so you know, Rob, we are recording this and I, I assume it's okay, yep. And uh, we have a really fun video for everybody to see that, uh, that Chris Rash sent over for us. So we decided we'd show us with some dancing birds, but um, just to get things started. So I thought we'd just turn it over to Candace. First, she has a few words and then she'll start the, uh, um, the fun video for us. Go ahead, Candace. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen first with just some hints about navigating Zoom um for you all and there's a bit of a lag whoops sometimes um so are you all seeing my zoom hints screen yes yes perfect okay so if you want to mute or unmute your camera or your microphone those controls are found in the lower left hand corner of, corner of your screen um once our presentation starts with um rob then um, we will probably go through and mute any microphones that are left open just to kind of minimize any background noise that might occur. Um, if you do want to ask a question, though, please go ahead and unmute it. If your video is freezing or if you have any buffering going on during the, the presentation, um, you can mute your video and that will often um, stop that um, because it will use less bandwidth. So that's just a hint. Um, if you want to show a reaction, um, you know, let us know that you like something or that you love something. Uh, there is a reaction button that's kind of fun that you can use. And then if you want to send any questions via chat, just click the chat icon at the very bottom. If your toolbar is not displaying on your Zoom window, just hover, move your cursor down to the bottom and it will appear. So again, to um, do the chat, you click on that chat icon and um, you will see the chat window typically open either right in the middle or on the right side. Um, you can um, send the message to everybody or you can use the drop down menu and send it to somebody privately. So type in your message, you know, tell us what you're seeing at your feeders and whatnot and send the message on its way. All right. Um, this, how do you yeah. send it? You just hit return after you've typed in um, on the chat? I think so. Um, or there could be a little send button. I don't have that on my screenshot, do I? So uh, it's, yeah, I think if you just hit enter, it will generally go. So I just do it automatically. So I can't say, <laughs> but um, yeah. Um, and then um, lastly, if you want to kind of adjust your screen view, look in the upper right hand corner um, of your Zoom screen and see if there is a speaker view option. Um, and then you, to optimize your viewing, um, select the full screen. And again, um, just kind of hover up in that upper right hand corner to kind of get the controls. You might have a few things that look a little different as well. So, but with that, some basic hints about viewing um, uh, things and interacting on Zoom, so. Thank you. With that, enjoy the presentation. So let me do a new share and we're going to queue up this video. And hopefully you all are seeing Dancing Birds. Is there music with it? Mm -hmm. There ought to be, um, let's see. Oh, it could be because I knew we'd have technical uh, difficulties here. Maybe I need to unmute my, and let's try again. Hmm. I'm not sure why the music is not being heard. Of 
course, this worked Sorry. when I tried it earlier. <laughs> of course. <laughs> the music is timed perfectly with the yeah. movements of the birds. Sorry that the audio wasn't working, but I was really impressed how very quiet everybody was. So at any rate, thanks for sharing that. And um, yeah, I will stop sharing now. Maybe we can put that on our website or if you want to maybe we try it again someday when we have the music because it's pretty cool. But thank you, Candace and Chris for bringing that up. So it's fun to see these kind of things. And maybe some of you recognize some of those birds that were in there from overseas travels or from around the United States. At least it makes you want to get back out on the road again, doesn't it? So, well, Francis tells us that we have $11,013.58 in our account right now, of which 324.48 is for the bird seed fund. So we're pretty good with that. We could always use a little bit more for that that bird seed fund. And that about a $3,000 increase since last month is mainly due to our good response that we had from our postcards that we sent out for uh, uh, renewals from, from people we haven't heard from from a while that maybe slipped their mind that it was time to renew local memberships. And out of that, we got quite a few national membership re renewals and some locals and some donations. So thank you so much people that came forth and gave a little bit more and renewed your memberships. It certainly isn't too late to do that for our local memberships. $15 go from January through a calendar year and National Audubon are $20 and those go by the year, the month that you joined. So and that money goes for our use. So right now we're our Next month, about a month from now, our board will be meeting to uh, look over grant applications from our six counties, from um, nature centers and stuff for, for projects that they wanna do that meet our mission, uh, our mission statement. And we had originally designated $4,000 for that. And it looks like we're gonna be able to up that. So if you know somebody in your county or city that has a, a project, bird friendly project or something with habitat renewal or preservation or uh, bird protection, um, give them a chat. Say, hey, have you turned in an application for a grant from a Prairie Rapids Audubon? We're always um, willing to help things out here locally. So again, thanks you for that. We ordered bricks for birds for Prairie Rapids Audubon, a $250 um, deal for the Hartman Reserve Nature Center for their new memorial walk where they'll have uh, where they have the bird feeders are up now and this spring they'll be laying the the path that goes through native habitats and for pollinators and for birds that will be planted in the spring so we'll be uh, supporting that and have our name in the bricks and then also for for uh, Dick Lynch and Opal Ewer for memorial bench and uh, plaques for their significant 
uh, memorial donations. Um, say the Great Backyard Bird Count is this weekend from Friday through Monday. Candace has a link on our website, gopraz.org. Uh, be a fun time to watch. You don't have to be an expert or anything to do it. Just do it in your yard, in your neighborhood, or a favorite place you like to, to be, to go. Watch birds for a while, record them, and send it in. It's a good, good way to be involved in citizen science. I believe that's through the Cornell Lab. Am I correct? I think so. All right. Um, so we'll be doing, oh, there, I saw an article in the newspaper, Art Hunt, and around here in town, if you've taken a walk over that Greenbelt Lake, you'll notice they have these little signs where you can look for clay birds that are hidden within the woods. And uh, it's kind of an interesting way to, to look for things as you're taking a walk around the, uh, around the lake, which is about a 45 minute walk on snowshoes or in boots or, or whatever. Um, they also, that's through the Waterloo Recreation and Arts. And they also have a program going on right now. Maybe you saw it in the newspaper. They have 65 bird houses, wren houses, that are, you can pick up first come, first serve, and decorate them however you would like. And then in March, I believe it's March 28th, they have a, an event from two to four over there where you can display your wren house and maybe some prizes will be awarded and such. But it's a, a good thought for the winter. Maybe get out, look for some clay birds, pick up a wren house, decorate it, and our Audubon will probably be involved with, the, with uh, helping out with their wren house um, dis, uh, display and awards program in, in uh, March. Uh, we're just about done with our blue bird surveys for climate change. Um, I, uh, the rash has actually had a bluebird last week, believe it or not, on a power line over up by ooh, Waverly, somewhere in that area. So you never know what you're going to see. We had red-headed woodpeckers on a couple of some of our points. We've been seeing rough-legged hawks out and around, uh, quite a few red-tailed hawks, eagles. Um, it won't be long, about a month. Hopefully less than a month, we'll start be seeing some uh, snow geese and waterfowl moving in. And hopefully by middle of March, the robins will be back and blackbirds will hang on, things, things are coming. Um, I think that's about all I have right now, but I'll check my notes. Yeah, oh, I know, um, we're, we're kind of like, I gotta show you this, I got this for Christmas, but. We're, we're, we're in hard times right now. You know, I'm a musician. I don't know if you can see that or not, but it's kind of a music joke, you know, but we are hard, hard times. And as far as I know, we're, we're still going to be doing virtual programs from now through May and, um, and recording them as well. So if you've missed the program or you've, oh, uh, want to review one from that we've had since the beginning of the year, uh, you can go to the website. They're archived. Our newsletters are archived for the last few years. And we have a look at one of the programs. We've got some really good ones. Uh, Doug Har was one of our first programs. And we, we listen to what you have to say for um, ideas for programming. And in our next, I got to look at this here. Next month, on uh, March 9th, we have Jessica Lanchill, who's a naturalist from Story County. We've had a renewed interest on uh, mushrooms. And so she's going to uh, give us some ideas on um, seven common edible mushrooms and the importance of mushrooms and fungi in our ecosystems. And uh, so that's an idea you had. And we were able to find, I think, the best person we could find in the state right now to help us with that. So that should be a good program um, as well. And we're one of the programs we were, we were asked about was about climate change and the effects of on our wildlife and on our birds. And as you you're probably aware, the uh, National Audubon has made some significant studies on uh, Audubon uh, on birds. It was survival by degrees program, and it came out some some really pretty startling results. 
and things that we really need to be aware of. And we talked to Doug Haar, and uh, who's our Iowa Audubon president. And he's also on the board, I believe, for the Minnesota Audubon. And we were asking about, do you know anybody could speak about climate change? And he says, oh, of course, Rob Schultz, um, who's in Minnesota. And we're very, very happy to have him as our speaker. Um, he's experienced on this topic. He serves as the vice president and executive director of Audubon Minnesota and the upper Mississippi River for National Audubon Society. And prior to, prior to Audubon, Rob served in executive director roles with International Wolf Center, the YMCA, the International Peace Garden, and the St. Paul Police Foundation. He's also been involved heavily with North Star Council of Boy Scouts of America, led some very successful fundraising campaigns. And he's working on a master's degree in biology from Miami University and enjoys photographing birds like many of us, wildlife, the Northern Lights, I'm jealous, and other things as well. So I'd like to welcome Rob Schultz to the stage here, or to the screen, for uh, Climate Change and Birds. Take it away, Rob. Gosh, it's great to be with you guys tonight. Thank you so much for having me. Um, you know, Doug, I really appreciate you uh, helping me to get in front of a number of our Iowa chapters. Uh, every time I, I have an opportunity to visit with one of our Iowa chapters, I feel like I walk away with a whole bunch of great new friends. And so it's really an honor to be here tonight. Um, and I, I will just say today is a really good day for me. I uh, got a box in the mail. It was actually from Doug and I am super, super excited. I don't know if you can quite see this, but, but it's the new Iowa uh, breeding bird atlas too. So I have some serious reading material to do thanks to Doug and uh, but it's great to be with you tonight, and I'm very um, excited to be able to talk with you uh, about climate change. And maybe just uh, before I kind of jump in that, um, let me give you a little bit of a, a background for uh, myself. <clears throat> I actually grew up um, south of the Twin Cities uh, in Jordan, Minnesota, and my parents uh, were both farmers growing up as kids, and so um, I spent a lot of time on the farm myself growing up. Uh, while we didn't live on a farm, uh, my grandparents owned a farm, and it was like my favorite place to go. So I would spend a lot of time out at the farm. Um, my uh, mom's side, they had a red farm, and my dad's side was a green farm. So we always heard the, the battle between uh, John Deere and International, and, uh, but it was, it was a lot of fun growing up. And those uh, early days really helped to form a lot of perspectives uh, that I have on the world that we live in. And I feel really blessed to have uh, been, you know, in a family where my parents were so intentional about taking me out, uh, me and my brother out uh, to so many of our state parks and to national parks. Uh, it seemed like we spent just about every weekend from Memorial Day each year, uh, all the way till Labor Day uh, at a different park. We had a tent at first and eventually uh, got a pop-up camper. But, um, you know, those were really amazing experiences to, to get in, into each of these different uh, places. We always really loved going to places where there was a naturalist who could help teach us about what we were seeing. And um, so our favorite state parks were those that had the naturalist programs and, um, you know, that I, those days uh, really changed my life and my priorities and the things that are that are important to me. And as I look back at some of those places now, I'm in my early 50s. So, you know, looking back um, to these places 40 years later, some of these places have changed a lot uh, and not necessarily for the good. I think about Sand Creek, which ran through our home, uh, through our backyard. Uh, behind, behind our home. And I, I think about all the time I spent in that creek uh, with my brother playing and, you know, catching crawdads and, you know, we were building dams and probably doing all sorts of things that we shouldn't have been doing. Uh, but it was really a, an amazing way to grow up. And now that particular creek is one of the most polluted creeks uh, in that part of the state. Um, it would be completely unsafe to, to go into those waters 
uh, anymore like what we did as kids. And so, you know, for me, um, I, like so many other people, I've seen a lot of things change. And as I began working for Audubon uh, almost two years ago, uh, one of the things that uh, I knew was a, a real problem before I started working with Audubon uh, was the climate change issues that we are seeing around the globe. And after I started working for, client, uh, for Audubon, um, it became even more clear that we have a major problem. And so tonight I'm going to uh, spend a little time presenting uh, this uh, report that Audubon has prepared. Um, it's called uh, Survival by Degrees, uh, 389 Bird Species on the Brink. Um, this is a copy of the actual report. Uh, we delivered it to Congress um, a little over a year ago. I've also hand delivered it to the governor of Minnesota. Um, we've really been working hard to get it into the hands of, of politicians and leaders uh, within the communities and the states uh, to help them understand some of the things that we are seeing on the ground uh, in terms of climate change and how it is affecting birds. So I'm going to actually go ahead and just start. I've got a PowerPoint uh, presentation that I want to share with you tonight. And so we'll have this uh, going. And, and as we work through this, um, there's a number of things I want to highlight. But if folks have questions, uh, feel free to, to ask those questions, uh, because really the goal is to try and help uh, educate everybody uh, about the incredible impact that climate change is having on birds. Uh, and the environments that they need, because they're the same environments that we live in. And birds are really a sentinel species. They are some of the first indicators when there are problems uh, within a, an environment or within a habitat. And so we're going to talk about that tonight because ultimately what happens to birds is happening to us as humans. Um, a little bit earlier, We'll go ahead and get this started. Um, if I can get my arrow, there we go. Um, so a little bit earlier, um, we talked uh, or we heard um, Tim talk a little bit about um, Cornell's work. And uh, in the fall of 2019, there were two different sci uh, science reports that came out uh, about how climate change was impacting birds. And uh, the first report that came out was a report that came out by Cornell. And in Cornell's report, uh, it talked about how over the previous approximately 45 years, uh, we had seen here in North America, a decline uh, of, bird species, uh, of bird populations by 2.9 million, almost 3 million uh, fewer birds uh, we were seeing from between the early 1970s uh, and that modern day. And when we think about uh, the number of birds uh, in North America, you know, during that time frame, uh, you, you're looking at um, a drop of 12 billion birds to approximately 9 billion birds. And this is a really serious issue. Um, when I think about Cornell's report, I think about it uh, in terms of looking backwards. We're looking in the rear view mirror to see what has happened over the last 45 to 50 years. Audubon's report is forward looking. It's trying to understand what will happen to bird species as we look towards the future. Uh, but one of the things, um, you know, at the same time I've been working on this master's degree in biology and from having done a ton of reading and a ton of reports, more than I want to count, um, I can tell you that it was um, not likely a situation where all of a sudden one day uh, we started losing birds and it was the same amount each year up until present day. When you take a look at a number like 2.9 billion birds, and if you're looking at a period of 45 years, roughly, um, you know, it's, it's likely a situation that during those first years, there was a real small number of birds. The, the population was redu uh, being reduced by a very small number. And as time has gone, gone on and pollution has taken more of effect, temperatures have risen on earth and all of these different factors uh, come into play 
you would see that number uh, grow at a very steady rate. But imagine if, you know, and let's just kind of think in broad terms here, imagine if during the first five years of that 45 year period uh, decline, let's say that we were only losing, you know, a couple million birds a year, maybe 5 billion birds, 10 million birds. Um, that would mean that towards the very tail end of that 45 year period of time, we would have had to have been losing a lot more birds than that. Let's take a number like 2.9 and, and divide it by 45 years. It comes out to roughly 66 million birds uh, disappearing per year. And so when we really try to look at that number and understand it from a scientific per perception uh, or perspective, we're looking at a situation where it started off as a small number, probably in the couple millions. And in recent years, it's probably in the hundreds of millions of birds that we're losing every year. This is a serious threat to the population uh, of birds. We know that climate change is having a horrific effect uh, on birds. And tonight we're going to spend a little time uh, talking about why this is truly a full-blown crisis that we need to try and address. Um, let me advance the screen there. So we know that uh, the warming, the global warming poses an exponential threat to birds. Uh, if this were a fire alarm uh, in a fire station, it would be referred to as a, as a five alarm fire, the most serious kind of situation uh, that you have. So on our screen, we see a picture of uh, what's actually the report. That's uh, the cover of the report. And you can download this report for free. We encourage you to do that. I'll give you a uh, URL, a website address in just a little bit uh, where you can actually find that. So there are five different takeaways that I'd like to talk about tonight from uh, this uh, scientific report. Uh, the first one is that Audubon's new science shows that about two thirds of our bird population in North America uh, is at risk of extinction if climate change actually reaches three degrees Celsius. Now, I do want to clarify one thing because it's really an important differentiation between the Cornell report uh, that's looking in the rear view mirror talking about the birds that we've lost. In that particular report, they are referring to uh, the population of birds. And so we know that we've lost about a quarter of the population of birds from uh, the early 1970s until essentially present day. Audubon's report is different. So as it looks to the future, it's not trying to predict uh, the number of birds that will disappear. Uh, that is very scientifically uh, difficult uh, to come up with. But what we can do, and, and we'll show you tonight how we did that, is we looked at species of birds. So here in the United States, um, we know that there are roughly 600 different species of birds, give or take a few dozen. Uh, and what we're saying is that um, <clears throat> we are at risk of losing up to two thirds, roughly, of those different species of birds. So 389 species of birds are at risk of extinction uh, if we allow temperature rises on Earth to uh, get as high as three degrees Celsius. The second takeaway from uh, the scientific report is that uh, there is also hope that if we are proactive in trying to address uh, some of the, the causes of climate change, if we can reduce the impact uh, that we're seeing in global warming, uh, we can potentially still save 76% of those bird species, but it requires action and it requires action right away. We're going to talk in a little bit about what that uh, particular action looks like. So, oops, there we go. So birds uh, localize this uh, climate crisis. They help us to understand locally how climate change uh, is affecting uh, bird species. Uh, and to help illustrate that, uh, Audubon has created a tool. 
And here you can see a URL. We're gonna actually visit this a little bit later in the presentation, because I wanna show you how you can use Audubon's website to zero in specifically on the city of Cedar Falls or your local counties or the state of Iowa or anywhere in North America to really understand the, the true impact the climate change uh, can have from a localized perspective. As we met with members of Congress, I think this was one of the most eye-opening um, tools that they had ever seen in the sense that we could look at their particular districts, their hometowns, we could look at where they go on vacation, uh, and we could talk with them about what kinds of birds they see right now and what kinds of birds they could, could very well see uh, if the temperature er, continues to change um, radically or erratically. So we'll come back to this here in just a little bit and demonstrate it for you. So as we look at all of this uh, info, um, it's, it's really important to understand that there was tremendous, tremendous uh, investment that went into creating uh, the scientific report. We're talking millions of dollars is what the cost of this was. Uh, and it involves massive amounts of data. Um, the, that, the use of massive amounts of data uh, has helped us to uh, really zero in on better predictions, finer detail, uh, and better analysis of uh, how these different threats to birds uh, will affect the, the survival of the various uh, species. And so from this report, we know that there are primarily nine major threats to birds, and we're going to look at each of those individually here shortly. A couple of them are listed here as examples, such as heat waves, fire, early springs, uh, but we're going to talk about specifically what those nine threats are as a result of climate change uh, to birds, and then how if we pivot in different ways, uh, trying to uh, stop some of the, the increases in temperature on Earth, how that will affect each. So let's go ahead and advance that. So as I had mentioned, uh, it was a robust and, and huge amount of data that was pulled together by Audubon in order to create this report. Uh, there were more than 140 million pieces of data from more than 70 different places that were all brought together through massive uh, computer systems uh, and data analysis and GIS analysis to come uh, up with the report uh, that, we, that we have repair, uh, prepared and to be able to provide you uh, tools to be able to look at the impact of climate change species by species uh, in North America. It's, it's never been done before to bring this much data together to look at uh, the impacts of climate change on birds like this. Here, there are a few different uh, sources of some of where that data came from. Let's just talk about those places for a few minutes so you understand where, where is Audubon's data coming from. It's coming from the Global Biodiversity uh, Information Facility, the USGS. It's coming from the North American Breeding Bird Surveys. It's coming from a whole number of universities and uh, educational uh, systems. It's coming from the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, uh, the, science, the Conservation Science uh, Center in Alaska, the Fish and Wildlife Service, the Park Service, many, many agencies and uh, educational institutions and monitoring organizations uh, provided the data that has helped to create uh, the report that you're about to see. And this model, this climate modeling, uh, does a number of things. It looks at the climate uh, that is uh, currently happening uh, in, in and throughout North America. It takes into consideration how land is being used, how do humans affect the use of that land. And it looks at uh, what, what we're calling here group-specific variables, but more specifically, what those group uh, specific variables are, it's looking at marshes, it's looking at grasslands, it's looking at different kinds of forests, it's looking at urban communities, it's looking at 
uh, rural communities. It's, it's taking into effect a lot of different types of uh, environmental factors on the ground. And then it's also looking at how uh, the global surface water uh, is affecting temperatures, how it will affect birds, uh, and how different uh, temperatures can increase uh, those water levels. And what does that mean in terms of our weather and the future of weather? So there's a, a lot of different pieces to this. As we look at survival by degrees, the report, um, what uh, our scientists decided to do was to try and look at it from three different perspectives. One, if we have a one and a half degree Celsius uh, increase in temperatures. Two, if there's a two degree Celsius uh, increase in uh, temperatures. And three, uh, a three degree Celsius um, uh, increase in temperatures. And as I've done these presentations uh, in the past and talked with folks, you know, across these uh, different states, a lot of questions come up in terms of, well, how do you measure that? Where are you getting these specific temperature numbers from? Because gosh, last summer, it seemed like it wasn't quite as hot last summer as, you know, summers in the past or last winter was warmer or colder uh, than what I remember. And so, um, I'm not a weather scientist, so I can't go deep into explaining this, but I'll try and do it uh, really from a surface level. Uh, they look at median temperatures across the earth and they look at whether or not those median highs and median lows are going up and down. And <clears throat> what we're seeing is that uh, the number that we're seeing here on the screen is that as of 2018, we're uh, nearing or at about a one degree Celsius increase uh, in temperatures. And that is within uh, the last 50 to 60 years. So the report uh, is looking at what happens if it goes up to one and a half degrees, which we're pretty certain it's going to do. Um, and what would happen if it goes to two or what would happen if it goes to three? we're really wanting to try and find ways to avoid those second two scenarios. So if it gets to one and a half degrees, this is the point in the Paris uh, Agreement that is commonly referenced. Um, if it gets to two degrees, then it's a much more difficult uh, situation for us to try and uh, deal with and, and much harsher on birds and other wildlife. And if it re reaches that three degree Celsius, um, then we are in some real trouble. And we're going to talk, I'm not going to get into the targets and the current policies. We'll wait until a little bit later into the presentation to talk about some of those things. Right now, let, though, let's go back and let's look at uh, this particular example. Um, here we have a wood thrush. We all love wood thrush. And you can see on the left uh, the current range of the wood thrush. This report uh, seeks to answer questions about what happens if temperatures go up. And so uh, under the projections, uh, you can see on the right hand side of the screen, do you guys, do you see my arrow? Hopefully you do. Um, you'll see one projection, which is for one and a half degrees and the other proje uh, projection, which is for three degrees. And you'll notice that uh, next to the one and a half degree projection, uh, if the temperature were to go up uh, to one and a half degrees, all of these areas uh, that you see red in, that's where we will lose uh, range or, or habitat uh, for the wood thrush. So we're, we're not likely to see them uh, anymore in these areas where uh, you'll see red because the temperatures are too high. And so that species will move to different areas uh, and the species uh, will shrink and, and can go extinct if those uh, temperatures change too drastically uh, on a continental basis. Next to that, to the right of that, you'll see uh, at a three degree Celsius change, look at how much range those uh, wood thrush would lose. It's significant. We won't see them anymore in Minnesota or Iowa. We're barely in their range right now. 
but we're sure not going to see them uh, if we end up having temperature changes uh, that are that extreme. Audubon's report put together an assessment of the vulnerability of each classification of birds. And some of the most uh, vulnerable birds are those that utilize the Arctic regions and the boreal forests, uh, those that use the western forests, those are also uh, in great uh, danger. There's great vulnerability uh, as those temperatures get to the higher end of that range. There are some birds, though, that will actually do just fine, that will not disappear from the landscape. Um, some birds, like, like raptors, uh, they may actually increase in numbers uh, with the, the types of climate change that we're talking about. So it's really important to understand that climate change affects every different species of birds differently. Uh, sometimes it can make, um, make it easier for a bird to uh, live in an area, but more often it doesn't. And so you really have to get into the specific data uh, to take a look at that. In terms of the big, uh, the big picture, what does this all mean? Uh, as we take a look at this, uh, you'll, you'll see that again, uh, areas where there are blue, uh, we are likely to see breeding of birds occur in, but areas that are turning orange and red, uh, we are likely going to be uh, losing as areas where uh, breeding will happen. And again, this is large scale. As we continue to look at some of uh, this uh, information, here's where we can actually start looking at what are those different uh, exponential uh, climate threats that birds uh, will, are, are affected by. Um, the, the most common one that we talk about a lot, because we know that as climate change uh, hits Earth, um, our polar caps begin to melt, we lose ice uh, sheets, uh, and that ultimately affects the, the level, the sea levels of the various seas around the world as well as the Great Lakes. And so changing sea levels uh, can be a serious threat to birds. Urbanization, so the loss of natural habitat, cropland uh, expansion can also be a major climate threat for birds because in, in so many of these places we're losing really important grasslands that, that birds depend upon. Extreme spring heat, that is a huge, huge um, a thing that can affect birds in their breeding. Spring drought, the, the fires that you see from uh, drought and the extreme temperatures that they create, um, heavy rains and false springs. Now to maybe just kind of uh, illustrate how some of these things are, are playing out on the ground right now um, in this particular region. I know that in recent years, we've seen more flooding of the Mississippi River than, than we have in the past. And I was talking with uh, a member of the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources who tracks the rainfall events. And one of the things that they've been noticing since the 60s and 70s uh, is that there are significant changes in the kinds of rainfall events uh, that we're seeing. Now, the amount of rain isn't necessarily changing significantly. Um, you know, when we look at the rainfall, and I'm, I'm using Minnesota here, so we'd have to again talk with the Iowa DNR to get the equivalents there. But in Minnesota, the amount of rain that's coming down each year uh, is fairly similar from one year to another. But what climate change is doing in the region is it is affecting the, the size of those rainfalls. And so instead of seeing um, as many small rainfall events, uh, rainfall events that would be between zero inches and a half of an inch, we're, we're seeing fewer of those. And when we do see rainfall events, we're seeing larger amounts of rain coming down. And so that can create and complicate the flooding uh, that happens in these river systems, uh, especially with the urbanization that has happened. Uh, there's been a loss of forests, loss of grasslands. Um, we've seen, you know, in farmland areas, there's a lot of drainage ditches being put in uh, to more quickly move the water to the riverways. 
And so what ends up happening is when we have these rainfalls, there's less water actually going into the ground and there's more water rushing through the watershed, flooding the rivers uh, and uh, creating a lot of flooding problems. And so uh, these things are all huge uh, factors for birds uh, living in these areas. Um, and these exponential threats are very real. Um, as we take a look at the United States, about 98% of the United States can be effect, uh, affected by one or more of these climate-related re, uh, threats under a three degree Celsius warming scenario. And, whoops, let me just go back. And then um, you can see obviously uh, the impact between one and a half and three degrees. So as we look ahead, 97% of species can also be affected by these multiple climate related threats under this three degree warming scenario. So it's not just the temperatures that are, that are going up that affect birds. It's also the issues with water, the issues with fire, the issues with uh, loss of habitat. All of these things combined make it very, very difficult for bird species uh, to be able to survive uh, like they have been in the past. And it's uh, certainly affecting the number of individuals. We've seen that as a result of the Cornell report. And we're really concerned about what it's going to look like moving uh, ahead. So climate change mitigation can really help to reduce those risks uh, to birds from the climate related threats across uh, over 90% of the United States. Here you can see on the left uh, in breeding areas versus on the right in non-breeding areas. It's important to remember that um, the places where we have these risks have lots of different threats. It's not just one of these threats. Oftentimes it's multiple of these threats layering upon each other that are creating problems for birds. So our third takeaway as we look at all of these different things is that for the first time, uh, as we've looked at these exponential threats, um, we know that if we face three or more uh, of these climate threats at three degrees, we're going to very likely lose 305 bird species. I'm going to show you how in just a little bit to look at which specific bird species uh, are at risk. And we also know that um, if that temperature is really one and a half degrees instead of three, it significantly reduces the number of species that are affected to roughly 34, give or take a few. The fourth takeaway is that every bird species will be affected in some particular way. Um, we will lose some species, other species will move. In some cases, um, the populations will go down. In some cases, they will go up. Um, every particular species based on our modeling will be affected. Here you see the common loon. And for people in the state of Minnesota, this is a real common site. If you go to uh, many of our uh, 10,000 lakes, especially in the northern half of the state, the challenge here is that as temperatures continue to rise, birds like the loon will move further and further north. And they're not likely going to be summering uh, in this part of the continent uh, when we start looking at a two to three degree uh, Celsius climate change uh, factor. The fifth takeaway is that we already know what we need to do in order to help protect these birds. We need to, to figure out solutions uh, to those exponential threats. How can we begin reducing some of those threats? How can we look at uh, some of those threats on an individual basis to try and come up with uh, real good solutions to help curb these problems? And so if we start working on this now, if we take it seriously and really dig into these, these challenges, um, we can truly make a difference. We can begin reducing the threats that birds face all across the country. Um, you know, birds can't fight climate change uh, themselves, but we can certainly help. And so I, I do wanna switch for just a second here to be able to show you 
that climate visualizer. I'm going to just switch screens for a second. And uh, we're going to show you that. And then once we've done that, then I want to open it up to questions uh, that we can try and help answer for everyone. So um, earlier, uh, we talked about uh, being able to go to uh, a website. If you go to the National Audubon Society's uh, website and you go to um, audubon.org backslash um, climate backslash survival by degrees, it will take you to this particular uh, page. You can also just go into Google and just type in Audubon climate report and it will take you here. And this is where you would want to go to learn more about the subject and to be able to uh, download a copy of the report that we've delivered to, uh, to our legislators and members of Congress. But I want to show you something as you scroll down on this page. Um, you can see uh, there's all sorts of uh, information here. Talks about you know what will happen uh, as the climate changes. Um, but as we scroll down, the part that's really good. This is like my favorite place. I love going to this where it says birds and climate visualizer. So I'm going to just take uh, as an example. Let's take a zip code for Cedar Falls. Let's use 50614. And, or you could also type in Iowa, but I'm not going to do that. And once you enter in your email address, I'll go robschultz.audubon.org. Um, once you do that and you hit search, this is going to take you to the climate visualizer for your particular community. And yes, this data gets narrowed down that tightly that you can look at what's going to happen right in your own community. You can look at your county. You can look at your state. Um, but once we hit search, it's going to uh, take us and it's going to show us what's happening in Black Hawk County. And so as we page down here, this is where it gets really interesting. Um, the climate study has identified that nine species in Black Hawk County, where Cedar Falls is located, there are nine vulnerable species. You can see what they are directly underneath here. It's the, the red-headed woodpecker, one of my favorites, the wood thrush, um, we can, you know, the scarlet tanager. Um, anyway, you can see uh, it lists the nine that are affected. Uh, you can look at the, the moderately vulnerable species. So these are species that are going to also be impacted, but not quite as severely. You can see those that will have a low vulnerability, uh, as well as those that will remain stable. Now, one of the things um, I encourage everyone to go in here and play around, look for your favorite birds. Let's see what's happening with them so that when you're out talking with other members of your chapter, or you're out in your community trying to help people understand how climate change is affecting birds, uh, you're familiar with your favorite birds and you can talk about uh, situations that are really personal to you. If you go up here, let's look just a little bit above where it shows the birds, uh, you can change the temperature scenarios. So I just clicked on 1.5 degrees instead of three degrees. And now you can see all of these numbers changed. Now there's only one high vulnerability species. I'm going to touch on that. And so we see it's the Henslow sparrow. I'm guessing you guys probably don't currently see a lot of those uh, in the area. Um, maybe you do, but um, some of the more vulner uh, moderately vulnerable species uh, we can see by going under uh, number 11, uh, you can see that, again, we have the red-headed woodpecker there, um, the towhee, the bobolink, the scarlet tanager, and, and others. Um, you can see what the low vulnerability is. Remember, we're at a degree, so we're not far from this particular point. It's likely at uh, the current rate that we're going to be at this point uh, before the end of this decade. And, you know, if we don't do anything, if, if we do nothing at all to try and curb the climate uh, change crisis, we're going to be at this 3.0 before the end of the century. The key is trying to take steps right now 
to help curb some of these impacts. But I encourage you to go in there and look at the different scenarios. Look at what it would look like under a one and a half degree um, warming scenario in your county or in your community. Look at the two degree, look at the three degree. Um, look up your favorite places where you like to go birding. If you like to go on birding trips, um, pick out, you know, is it northern Minnesota? Is it down in Nebraska? Where, where do you like to go? Look up that info and become familiar with what's going to happen uh, at these different uh, warming uh, scenarios so that you, you get a real good feel for that. Now, if you want more information and more detailed information on this, you can also select on a bird. So let's go up to the three degree because, again, I just want to show uh, show this to you. So we have nine highly vulnerable species, and I'm a huge fan of the redheads. So let's touch the redheaded woodpecker. And once we do that, you'll see the web page uh, will uh, load. And here's where we're going to get the real detailed info on the wood on the redheaded woodpecker. So here we're looking at the state of Iowa. And at a three degree, again, up here, at a three degree warming scenario, you can see they will be gone from almost the entire part of the state. We might still see them just a little bit up in that driftless area, um, up in north uh, eastern Minnesota, uh, Iowa and southeastern Minnesota. If we switch that to two degrees, now you'll notice that um, their range has been margin marginalized in a number of places, uh, but that there's still stability. These green areas indicate stability. Blue areas mean that the population may actually increase. So at two degrees, it's very possible that we'll see an increase of some of the, the red-headed woodpeckers in parts of Wisconsin, uh, in a tiny little area of Minnesota, but it's really fascinating. I, I love spending time on here, looking up my favorite birds, looking up you know the places where I vacation, the places where I go birding, the places where I live, you know where I live, um, to see what's going to happen at all of these different scenarios. And we really hope we hope so much that each of you will use this really important tool. It's free. It's free for everyone in the world to use. All you need is, is a computer and uh, the ability to go to Audubon's website uh, in order to use it. So um, this, is, this is your hard work at work through the National Audubon Society. When you make a contribution to Audubon, when you try and help us do uh, this important conservation work, this, these are the kinds of tools that we can create to really help uh, understand what's happening with these species and to think about management plans and conservation plans uh, that we try to utilize in order to preserve species and to promote uh, their, their return to places, especially areas uh, where there's been habitat loss. So um, a very fun thing to, to, well, I should say it's, it, for me, I find it fun to go onto the website and look things up. Sometimes the information that I find on specific species um, is really disheartening, but it also helps me to know that those are the species that we need to do more uh, to try and preserve and try and protect. So I hope that you'll take advantage uh, of the Audubon website, of our, uh, uh, our report, which you can download the same document. We're trying to save paper. So um, we didn't have a lot of them uh, printed. Our, our goal is to try and get people to uh, download those off of the website and be able to look at those and then um, talk with legislators, talk with your elected officials, and really try to, to get some changes underway that will help protect these species. So I've talked a lot, and I apologize for dominating so much of our time tonight, um, but I get really passionate about this. Uh, and I know you do too, because uh, we all care deeply about these birds and we want to do great work. So with that, um, I'm, I'd like to open it up for questions and um, hopefully try and, try and be able to answer them if, if you have some.
Hey, Rob, this is Candace. Could you yes. show me again real quick kind of how you got to that prediction tool? Absolutely. Um, if you go to, and I'm just going to highlight it here, um, www.audubon.org, and then you just do backslash climate, backslash survival by degrees, that will take you to the, the main page that has the climate report. It's kind of red in color. You can also just Google it. If you just simply Google survival by degrees, or if you Google Audubon's uh, climate report, it's going to take you to this particular page uh, that, uh, oh, you can't see that. I'm sorry. Let me bring that back up. Um, it's going to take you to this uh, reddish color page. Uh, so that uh, once you're here, then all you need to do is simply scroll down and you scroll down about two thirds the way um, down the page to where it says birds and climate visual visualizer. Ah. This is the tool uh, that will allow you to look species by species to see what's happening in any little nook or corner of North America to each of the 604 bird species that we worked to build this report on. Great, thank you. I am um, going to be posting that to our website. So thanks for the extra uh, help on that. Thank and you Mark, for doing that. Where do you get to the report again to download the report on that same oh, website? Yep, let's bring, let's bring that back up and I'll help you find that. There we go. All right, so you can download uh, the report. I think it's just by, um, okay, we touch that. Give me one second, because I know I downloaded it myself in here. Here we go. Um, you'll want to come down to this picture of an owl which is actually a lot of little pictures kind of all glued together. And then if you just simply uh, touch this, read the special climate issue of Audubon magazine, uh, that will take it take you to that. And um, you can also go in here uh, when we touch the very bottom one, uh, you can also read more about it down at the very, very bottom. But let's go back up here. And so again, where it says read the special climate issue, you'll want to touch that. Um, this will include what, uh, what was shown inside uh, Audubon magazine a little over a year ago when this report came out. And you can actually download the really big version of this green report from within inside there. If you touch on the survival by degrees, 389 uh, species on the brink. That will allow you to download this in a PDF format onto your computer. And the other thing that I can do too, if, if anyone's having trouble downloading that, I can also send uh, the PDF document to someone in your chapter and you guys are more than welcome uh, to post that uh, particular document on your website uh, so that people can download it directly from there. We want people to utilize this. We, we invested a lot of time, a lot of hard work, a lot of resources to make this happen. And so the more people that can use the climate visualizer, the reports, both the big report and the, the summary, uh, what you're seeing here, the, what appeared in the magazine, this was an abbreviated summary. So it gives you all of the high points uh, if you actually I'm going to stop sharing the screen here for a second. If you actually got a copy of the report that we're giving to members of Congress or to legislators, this is the scientific report. It's about 68 pages long. Um, there's a lot of scientific data in here. Um, so it's a lot heavier of a read. Um, it's a really good read if you're interested in it. But if you're looking for that real quick overview to give you the really important points, kind of like an executive summary, then look for, um, we'll bring it up on the screen one more time. 
then you want to read this particular document, uh, Birds Can't Fight Climate. Oop, wrong thing popped up. What did I do there? Uh, let's see. I pulled the wrong page. Sorry about that. So this is more of the executive summary uh, that you'd find on the website. And then again, the detailed one is this one right here where it says survival by degrees, 389 species on the, on the brink. So. Bob, this is Tom. Hey, Tom. And my, my screen says Mac, that's because of what it's called. I haven't figured out how to figure that out, get the name on Anyway, that doesn't matter. If somebody has a question, you put it in the chat and then, um, Candace can uh, bring that up if we're talking, answering something else, if you think of something. Um, I have a question and it's, it involves uh, insects and food sources. And a lot of us here in Iowa have been um, concerned as well, probably nationally about a, de a severe decline actually in some areas of insects. We've traveled during the summer and we don't see them splattering on our windshield like we used to. And there's various reasons for that. And also food sources about climate with, um, we get periods of drought, which we've had a little bit in Iowa and where some food sources maybe might not develop very well by fall. Um, uh, not so uh, there's a lot of different data that's come into this report. Um, how much, how much of that has been from entomologists, from um, the botanists and such that have very similar concerns that we all have on, with temperatures rising? Yeah, you know, I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, neonicotinoids are a huge uh, issue uh, in terms of insects. You know, there's, there's so many chemicals uh, that are being used uh, in agriculture that are having just a catastrophic impact uh, on insects. And, you know, insects are the food for so many of these birds. And when we start losing food sources uh, for birds, uh, we lose birds. They're not going to be returning to areas. Um, you know, there's a lot of work that has to be done to try and figure out how we balance out the use of chemicals with our crops and how we, um, you know, how we take that into account in terms of the, the impact that it's having on birds and insects and so many other elements of our ecosystems. Uh, so I'm glad that you, you brought that up. You know, one of the things that uh, many of our chapters are really interested in is trying to figure out how can we do more native plantings. And native plantings are really important. I can't underscore the true criticalness uh, of native plantings. There's research that finds that that has been finding that um, in many cases, in heavily uh, in areas where there's heavy agriculture, oftentimes communities are islands for for insects and for bees uh, and for birds and so many other elements of the environment that simply cannot they cannot survive in these massive seas of agricultural areas because of all of the chemicals that are being used and the dust that is uh, in these areas. And so it means that communities play an even more important role than we may have ever understood in the past uh, in being islands for uh, insects and for birds to, to be able to survive as they're trying to migrate across these massive uh, massive areas. So thank you for raising that. You know, I, I think whatever your chapter can do and other chapters can do to really try and promote, um, you know, native plantings as much as possible, we, we have to try to ensure that birds have the insects that they need uh, for food. And when we use so many different kinds of ornamental bushes and non-native plantings, uh, they just cannot sustain the types of insects uh, that so many of these birds need to survive. So it's those are really important factors. You know, this is not a this is not an easy fix. There's not just one or two things 
that can be done to reverse uh, this massive loss of, of bird populations and uh, the impact that all of these uh, things are having. Uh, but they're choice points. You know, and, and that's how I, I try to look at this is that I as an individual cannot fix all of these different problems, but I can make a choice. I can make a choice each day to do something just a little bit different that's going to mean that my yard or the place where I live is more habitable for birds or for insects or for wildlife. And if we can get every member of Audubon doing that, if we can get every member uh, of communities doing that, if we can start a movement where we've got thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of people, you know, taking small steps, taking these choice points and making a decision that you are going to try and do something better for birds and insects uh, and native plants, it will make a difference. It will start to turn some of these issues around. And it can be as simple as just educating people that, you know, you really don't need to, to spray your lawn five times over the course of the summer, you know, all of these different um, chemical treatments are really, they're affecting pollinators, they're affecting other insects, uh, and they, they do have a, a compounding impact. So thank you for bringing that up. I'm, I'm so glad that you did and that you're thinking about that. That's, that's a, uh, a big goal for our um, Audubon and uh, native plantings. We've been talking about that for quite a while and bird-friendly communities of which Waterloo, Cedar Falls, Denver, and now probably Tripola in our region is gonna be. Um, and it all, all fits, we're all working together. You know, I like your idea about choice, about what you can do in your own yard, your own community, it's a uh, well thought. Do we have any other questions, Candace? Coming in or? Does anybody else have a question? If you want to just chime in, you can hit your mute button off and ask away. I'm not seeing anything in the chat per se. Okay. Yes, I could I could add something. Yes, David. Uh, in the uh, Audubon, the special issue of Audubon back in the uh, fall of 19, there was a whole section at the back of that of what things we can do in our own neighborhood and our own backyard, uh, our guide to climate action. So we might want to look at that again and, and read through that and see what we can do. It's a really good refresher. And, and thank you for reminding me. You know, we, um, we moved our, our Audubon office and I had a whole bunch of extra copies of those inserts and uh, they're in storage right now and I can't find them. So I've, I'm so glad that you uh, thought of that, David, and, and helped to remind us uh, that that is a wonderful, wonderful resource in that particular uh, copy of the magazine. Thank you. And I've I may, go ahead. Posted, I, I have just posted links to that um, climate action handbook and the survival by degrees reports to our webpage for everybody to access. Way to go, Candace. You rock. Hey. She's right on. <laughs> um, I might add, we've, we, this is the fourth year that our chapters participated in the Climate Watch surveys. And it's just fun, a, a fun way to get out and go to the same points every year. But I, I couldn't help but notice, and maybe some of the others did now in our fourth year, I asked, that, are you actually seeing anything more habitat, the same habitat or less habitat? And every year after we seem to see just a little bit less, a little bit less, that wetland that was there is now plowed farmland. There's a house where there used to be some habitat. The place we saw bluebirds before is gone. Um, that fence row is out. The cedars that provide some of the cedar, that's been cleaned out. And we, we really like to celebrate successes, you know, like somebody's doing something in their yard or you, you see that, but across the state, it's hard, you know, to find good, uh, good places. I just read today, 
I believe I don't have all the details that the budget for the Iowa DNR has been reduced to by like 8 million a year or something. It's a, a amount that takes us back in the stone ages, almost back to the depression times. Um, we just need to write letters, you know, and let them all, all let our people know that the increased use in our state parks and are important to everybody. There's a lot more people out buying hunting and fishing licenses up, bird watching, snowshoeing, hiking, and to reduce the funding again. And um, where I think the people really, really want that. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's critical. So I get off my soapbox. <laughs> You know, thanks so much for bringing that up. And, and if you don't mind, I, I do want to give a plug for uh, for our local Audubon. Um, you know, as we were talking a little bit earlier in the presentation, um, Audubon is going through a little bit of reorganizing right now. And uh, in the past, we've had state offices. Uh, those state offices are, are literally being converted into field offices. And so as we look at Audubon here in the, in the upper Midwest, uh, Audubon in Minnesota, Iowa, and Missouri uh, is being grouped together as the Upper Mississippi River Iowa, or Upper Mississippi River Audubon. Um, I don't know if that's going to be the final name or not, but they're looking at that saying, we want Audubon uh, in this region to work together within these three states. And we have Doug Har who is one of our awesome advisory board members. Um, it started off as Audubon, Minnesota. We're currently right now trying to figure out how we rebrand everything and how we roll that out so that we're not seen as Minnesota anymore, but we're seen as Upper Mississippi River, or if there's a new name uh, that we're going to go by. And I bring that up because I, you know, I really appreciated it was so a little over a year ago, uh, Doug had helped to set up an opportunity for me to go down to uh, Sioux City and meet with the Iowa chat or with the Audubon chapter there. And some of you may know Ed Sibley. I really like Ed. He's, you know, an awesome advocate for birds and for, for um, Audubon. And he said, I don't like the name Upper Mississippi River Audubon because the Mississippi River isn't anywhere near where we are. And he's right. It doesn't, you know, that name doesn't necessarily represent uh, all of our Audubon chapters in all of these three states. And so we're, we're wrestling with that right now to try and think of how could we come up with a name that really unifies these three states that, that really allows us to work really effectively together uh, so that we're supporting river systems, but also critical bird habitat areas. You know, the reality of it is this area is a critical, critical part of the migratory flyway. I get really energized when I think about the fact that 60% of the migrating birds in North America use the Mississippi flyway uh, for migration. And, you know, the Mississippi River and it's all of its um, really important tributaries, you know, there's like 14, I don't know if you've counted them before, uh, but there's like 14 or 15 major rivers that pour into uh, the Mississippi River. And it is a critically, critically important um, watershed within the center of the United States. It's one of the 10 most important uh, water river systems in the world. Um, and it's our home. It's where we all live, whether you're right at, at Creekside or Riverside, uh, or even if you're in, you know, off of that a couple hundred miles, you're still in this important watershed that birds uh, desperately need as part of their, their migratory uh, routes. And you know, I'm very committed to figuring out how do we do more to really marshal all of the resources that we can in this region, in Iowa, in Missouri, and in Minnesota to really support birds well. Um, I get to see some of the inside science before it's really even released to the public, you know, and I see these heat maps and um, it's powerful. I get kind of emotional when, when I talk about this because you know, it's, it's just like you're seeing, um, you know, the, the veins for, you know, where 
where birds travel throughout the country. Uh, and they follow the Mississippi. I mean, they're within a couple hundred miles of it. And then all of a sudden they dart up uh, through northwestern Minnesota to head up towards the Arctic uh, as part of their migratory uh, routes. And, you know, these areas are critically important for birds. And so, you know, I want to do more uh, for all of us to be able to be working together. I'm so thankful that Doug is on the advisory board because he's been working hard, really hard to advance Audubon's work in Iowa. Uh, he's opened the door to, to the Iowa DNR uh, to help us be able to, to work with them. We're currently looking at um, the likelihood of adding four Audubon positions <clears throat> in the state of Iowa sometime within the next one to two years. Uh, and that's all as a result of Doug's uh, helping us connect with the, the Iowa DNR uh, and them seeing the importance uh, in trying to do this work uh, alongside their staff teams. So. It's really exciting. I'm sorry for talking so much. I, I no, no. get so passionate about this stuff and then I get emotional and it's just, it's exciting, so. That's why you're here. <laughs> That's why we're- Yeah. Uh, That's why we all are here, so. I yeah, appreciate your wisdom. Um, Candice, do we have any other questions or comments? Thank you so much for oh. having me. It's really an honor to be here tonight and Pleasure. To, to connect with all of you. I just, I really admire uh, each of our chapters and, and hope that as soon as this pesky pandemic is over, that I can come and meet you in person and have a picnic or just hang out and go do some birding together. So we, we'd love to have you come down. So I love maybe, Iowa. So maybe I'd next love year we'll get, get you in here and, and do that. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have anything else there? Yes, yes. Oh, there you go. There you are. So um, David asks that Audubon has recently formed a partnership with the International Dark Sky Association. Can you comment on this partnership? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, so being a Northern Lights photographer, I'm deeply passionate about the dark skies as well for uh, very good reasons. Um, but I, I know that this is a very recent development. We don't necessarily have all of the, the details yet, but I know that the basis of the partnership uh, is that dark skies are, you know, ideal for birds that are, that are migrating. Um, we see, you know, so many problems with birds colliding into lighted buildings. Um, you know, during my first months with Audubon, um, a big part of the work that I was doing was fighting the NFL over the stadium uh, in the Twin Cities and all of the horrific uh, bird deaths that were happening there. Um, we've gotten them to turn down the lights. Uh, we're, we're working really hard to get them to, to fix the windows with a number of different solutions. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the pandemic hit and there's no income for the stadium. Um, and so they don't have any money to do anything. I um, actually just heard that they're $27 million. Um, I think it's $27 million behind in payments on the, bu on the building uh, because of the loss of income. So, but I'm, I'm confident that when we come out of the, the pandemic that we're going to be, they're great people. They really, you know, the, the leadership of the stadium wants to do things uh, that will change that. But, you know, lighted buildings are a real problem. So are lighted communities. You know, when there's a lot of light pollution, uh, it confuses birds as they're trying to navigate uh, through um, different areas. Um, you know, one of the things <clears throat> I'd like to talk about, I, I'm not current right now, but, but I'm a licensed pilot, you know, and when you're up flying an airplane at night, um, and you're trying to understand where you're at simply by looking at the ground, you know, you've got all of this light pollution. Um, it, it's just, it gets really confusing. I, I can appreciate the confusion that birds uh, experience uh, when they're trying to navigate, you know, these, these different landscapes with all of this intense light. So it's, it's exciting to hear that we're doing that partnership. I hope that it, it really can come out uh, and produce some great solutions for birds, um, as well as for being able to see the Northern Lights. And did you know that you can actually, there are times 
if they get strong enough, you can see them in parts of Iowa. Yeah. So yeah. has anyone seen the Northern Lights in Iowa? I'm just yeah. curious. Awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Very cool. So Mr. So had, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Craig. Okay. Uh, on my mind, I, I'm trying to think how to phrase this. Okay. Uh, is it possible for you to send a list uh, indicating when you'll be speaking on Zoom to our prairie, to a prairie office group so we can plug into other presentations that you make? Sure. Oh, I'd be happy to. If you could send yeah. that to Prairie Rapids, I think we could probably post it if Tom would allow that. <laughs> I'll let you guys know. So I love talking about wolves, cheetahs, the northern lights, and birds. So, <laughs> so but it's all fun. You know, it's just it's about getting out there and just appreciating this amazing planet that we live on. I just I feel so blessed to be here. You know, my biggest fear in life is that I'm not going to live long enough to get out and see everything. You know, it's every place I've been to. It doesn't, you know, when you're in Nor in uh, Iceland, you know, and you see the northern lights come out there, it just takes your breath away. Or, you know, Africa, you know, I'm sure you experienced this too, Tim, you know, being there at night, watching the Southern Cross move across the sky and, you know, hearing the incredible wildlife and animals that are there. I mean, get out and experience this world. It's, um, my dad loved to travel. And in 2016, we were going to do the trip of the lifetime. He, he so badly wanted to do an Alaska cruise. And um, so we'd been planning on, on this for years. We started a payment program because it was kind of, you know, kind of an expensive trip. And um, it was a week before we were to leave, he died in the middle of the night of a heart attack and, you know, never made it there. And, and you know, I just, I said to myself at that point, I don't want that to be me. You know, I, I've got a list of places I want to go. You know, none of us know when, when our time will be up. We just have to make the most of every day that we have and get out there and experience these things. Because when I go to these places, um, it changes how I think about things, you know, and, and I had that in, you know, I won't bore you with a lot more stories, but, but there is one important one. So I was working for the Wolf Center. It was, I think, 2018, and I kept getting these emails uh, in the middle of July about how there was, um, there was an orca whale that had lost her calf in Puget Sound, and she would, uh, she would not leave uh, her her calf. Her calf was deceased and for about two weeks she stuck with her calf and she would not leave it. You know, and all of these um, environmental organizations were blasting out emails about this and what a terrible thing. And I thought, you know, I want to get out there and see what's going on. And so we, um, for the, the next weekend, we uh, went on Sun Country. We found a really low rate uh, airline ticket. We flew to Seattle, rented a car, drove up to, uh, you know, and hopped on a boat and made our way out there. And um, it changed my perspective really in a big way because I was just expecting to see this really, really sad situation when I got there. And it was anything but that. I mean, we were out on, we were on a whale watching boat. Uh, we went out to see the orcas. The, the first thing that threw me off guard w was all of the security. I, c I could not believe the Washington Department of Wildlife, all the boats that they had out in this area. Mm -hmm. um, they were keeping all other boat traffic far away from where the orcas were. Um, nobody was getting close. Um, you know, they, they talked about on the boat all of the precautions that were being taken to try and protect uh, this pod of orcas. And, you know, it was, it was a really good experience to get there and, and to be able to see it myself and come up with my own perception of what was, what was happening. And uh, so we, you know, we uh, had an extra day or two. We decided to drive around Puget Sound and, you know, 
while we were on the boat, we had learned about all of the things that are really affecting the orcas and and um, salmon, you know, the, the harvesting of salmon and all of these different things. And I remember being on the south end of Puget Sound uh, and we stopped at a gas station to fill up and I looked out on the sound and um, there was a lot of activity down by the water. There were people gathering, there were two boats and all of a sudden these boats went out and they started going out into the bay um, and they were out there a ways. It looked like they were pulling something. And then I realized that they were pulling nets and they were fishing nets. And I started feeling really upset because I thought they're, they're getting all the fish for the orcas. Why are they harvesting all of the fish? And, you know, there were more and more people gathering down there. And all of a sudden these trucks started pulling up and on the sides of uh, the trucks, um, this was a food shelf operation. They were, they were collecting fish for uh, this food shelf um, for people who couldn't, you know, they didn't have enough food. And, you know, just getting out and experiencing all of these things, it, it will test your emotions. It will test how you think about things. It will test how you perceive different things. And, and I came back, it just, it, it really changed my perceptions. And I'm so glad that I went. And Every trip that we've been on, I try to study before we go and understand, you know, what we're likely going to see and what's been the controversy in, in the area and what kinds of questions can I ask. I mean, I, I remember in Budapest when we were there, you know, and we were talking with someone um, about communism and what it was like. And, you know, he said, this, this older gentleman said, I'm just so glad I don't have to carry my booklet around anymore. And I was like, your booklet? And he said, yeah, my booklet. And he, so we asked him, well, what is the booklet? And he said, well, everyone, you know, during the communist times in Budapest, you had this work booklet and you had to carry this with you. And every day when you went into your place where you were working, they would stamp your booklet that you showed up uh, to work that day. And um, he said, you never ever got caught walking around Budapest uh, without your booklet um, because they could throw you in jail. And he said, if you were missing a stamp, you know, if, if you were missing a stamp in your booklet, you could be thrown into jail. And I said, well, what if one day you were sick? And he said, well, then you had to go to the doctor and you'd get a doctor stamp, you know, and you know, so get out there, ask questions, talk with people, try and understand, you know, this amazing planet that we live in and the experiences that they have, because it's so amazing the things that you learn when you do so. But again, thank you for having me yeah, tonight. It's thanks. an honor. Candice, do you have anything else? Oh, she's muted, I guess. Um, there was just oh. a couple comments about great presentation. Um, one of our members said that um, she got her farmer husband to turn off one light later in the evening because of too many lights there in the country. So chipping away at that farmer attitude. So little by little, again, just shows that small changes can build to larger changes. So um, yeah, so that was great feedback. Thank you. What a great choice point. Great. Well, if there's nothing else, I think we'll close up. And Rob, it's been a pleasure to, to uh, see you on screen. And great people from uh, uh, Georgia, the state of Washington, all around Iowa today. Gina Hall, if she's still there. Um, it's nice to see people again. And so have a good, safe, warm weekend. And we'll see you hopefully next month. And, uh, Thank you, Rob. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Very good. Thanks, Rob, for sure. All right. Take care. You good bet. Night. Thank you. Thank you. Nice. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.